B'Shem Hashem Na'aseh V'Nasliach. Welcome back to our weekly shiur. Um, we started last week doing our shiurim, hopefully Bezrat Hashem for the future as well. Here and there, we'll try our best to keep it up this way where we're, um, we're, we're doing Zerah Shimshon on the parasha. And uh, as I discussed last week, for those of you that were not with us last week, uh, Zerah Shimshon is a very, very jam-packed sefer full of segulot. The Zerah Shimshon was an 18th century um, rav that passed away, unfortunately leaving no children because his only son passed away in his lifetime. And he made, a, uh, he made a promise before he passed away that anyone that learns his sefer, anyone that learns his Torah and publicizes his Torah, he, will be bl- he or she will be blessed with having many, many children and having many brachot. And you have to read the Sefer yourself. It's a very poetic uh, blessing that he gives for Rufu'ah Shalema, Parnasat especially for Zivugim and having children. It's the, the biggest segula that I've come across in years. And I have a lot of different uh, letters that I've read of proof that people have tried this. So, and it has worked. So basically... Definitely try this at home, the Sefer of Zerah Shimshon. That's what we are doing. So, um, the Zerah Shimshon on this week's parasha, one of the, well, it, on each parasha, the Zerah Shimshon has many, many chidushim, many ideas on different things on the parasha. We're just going to go ahead and pinpoint one of them that I'm going to share with you tonight. So, the Zerah Shimshon talks about the Haftarah. We rarely find that we discuss the Haftarah, the weekly Haftarah that we read every, par- every parasha for the parasha. We read the entire parasha. And then in shul, usually we read the Haftarah quickly. No one really knows basically what's going on, why we're doing this Haftarah. So the Zerah Shimshon is going to elaborate on a piece of this Haftarah, actually the first few words of the Haftarah. So we begin. al piro rov Haftarah parasha when you see most of the haftarot of every parasha, any parasha that you read, they are somehow connected to that parasha. And that's why that haftarah was picked by the Chachamim to be the haftarah of that week's parasha. It's not by chance that we picked uh, haftarah A or haftarah B or haftarah X for certain parashiot. There is a reason behind them. And the Chachamim had different kavanot, different intention as to why they picked whichever Haftarah they picked for what parasha. So this one, the Zerah Shimshon says, the reason why this week's parasha, the Haftarah of Parashat Haye Sarah, is the Haftarah that talks about the um, David HaMelech in his old age, and he has gotten, as he had gotten very, very old, is because... In our parasha, in parashat Chaye Sarah, we speak, the Torah speaks about Avraham Avinu, when he had become old. And the Pasuk says, Avraham zaken babayamim. And Avraham had become old in days. And therefore, the Haftarah also opens up with the same words, which you rarely find exact sentences used for two different indigu- individuals in two different times. It says in our parasha, Avraham zaken babayamim, and Avraham had become old in, 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 with days, in his days, which we'll discuss what that means as well. And then Haftarah says, Vahamelech David zaken babayamim, and King David had become old in his days. The Navi, the Navi comes and elaborates on certain things that had happened in those days in the time of King David. Here's what was going on. And we're going to get to some controversial stuff. I love talking about King David. Those of you that know me, it's one of my things. So um, uh, the Haftarah talks about David HaMelech. And at that time, here's what was going on. King David had become old. And he had been stricken with this, uh, sadly to say, with, with, with an illness. And in this illness, the problem was that he could... He would not be warm. No matter what David HaMelech did, he would not feel warm. And it says that all of his sarav, va'avadav, all of his servants and people that worked for him, kept bringing him more and more things to put on him, more blankets and more uh, skins of animals or whatever would, would possibly give a person warmth. 
And David HaMelech did not feel any warmth whatsoever. He imagine a person constantly being cold. And it wasn't because of old age. David HaMelech wasn't old actually when he passed away. He wasn't as old as others. He just did not feel warmth. And we know it is brought down as to why this happened to David HaMelech at the end of his days. It goes back to the story of Shaul HaMelech. King Shaul, when King Shaul was... When King Shaul was um, 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 chasing David HaMelech to get rid of him, David HaMelech didn't want to harm King Shaul. And therefore, um, one time when David HaMelech found Shaul and cornered him in a cave, and Shaul HaMelech had no idea that David HaMelech, King David, or at that time still, I mean, no, at that time he had already been anointed king by Shmuel HaNavi, by Samuel, but he wasn't publicly declared as the king yet. And Shaul did not know that David, David HaMelech, was in the cave. And David HaMelech could have, in an instant, could have come from behind and taken care of Shaul. But he did not. Instead, what he did was, he took his knife and he cut a little corner of the cloak of Shaul HaMelech as proof. Later on, he showed Shaul. And he said, Shaul, you know, I had a chance to hurt you, but I didn't. You want proof that I could have hurt you and I didn't? Here's a piece of your cloak that I have. I was right behind you. I was an inch away from you. And what did I do? I did not hurt you. I took a piece of your cloak instead. This is proof that I don't want to fight with you. I don't want to hurt you. So, um, therefore, because of that, Chachamim say, and it's very, very deep, and it's really hard to understand. Even though King David had every right to protect himself, however, it turned out to be disrespectful to the kingship. Disrespectful to the kingship of Shaul. And because he cut the little piece of the cloak of Shaul HaMelech, Chachamim say, that's why Hashem said, you took the cloak, you ripped the cloak of a king, of a sitting king, and because of that, the cloak that you will wear at your old age will no longer serve you meaning you will not have warmth. And because of that, David Melech did not feel warmth towards the end of his life. No matter how much they covered him up, it did not help. Nothing at all. This is the, the kuva, this is the timing that we are discussing and the Haftarah talks about. When it says, David zaken and David was old in days, it's the time that he could not feel any more warmth. And as much as they would bring, it wouldn't help. So what did the Chachamim do? The Chachamim, the Chachamim had an idea. Now this is where it gets a little controversial. And honestly, I do not want to get into the details of this because there's too much to talk about when it comes to this situation. So I will only speak on the surface. I see some of your eyes are tinkling there because you know what's, gonna, what's about to come, right? My dear friends from my old Shiurim. But I, I, I can't get too much into details. So it says, Therefore, Hagmara Omeret, the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, whenever, <clears throat> whenever the king needed warmth, the Chachamim came and they hired, they asked a young woman to come and be the personal, so to speak, uh, nurse of King David to only be with David HaMelech in a room and serve him in that way and she would provide that warmth for David HaMelech. And in that way, David HaMelech would no longer feel cold anymore. Now, this was problematic, as people are already probably thinking. Why? From one end, David HaMelech was not able to marry her. Why wasn't David HaMelech, why wasn't he able to marry her? Why couldn't he marry her? Uh, you could turn on your mics and try to answer. Why wasn't David allowed to marry her? Why wasn't he allowed to do it? Right, because, because he already had the maximum amount of wives that a king was allowed to marry, which was in fact 18. So David Amelech was already, was already there and was no longer able to marry another wife. Therefore, it was problematic. Now, he needed to have this girl, this young lady with her in the room. 
but he could not marry her. And from the other, from the other end, Umeidach, from the other end, Im David Amelech lo Yisaena, if David Amelech would not marry her, Asur la l'shot imo b'chadro, Mishum shabet dino shel David gazru shasur leit yached im isha pnuya. He was not allowed to be with her in a room because the Bedin, his own Bedin, David HaMelech's court had ruled at that time, made a decree that you were not allowed to be in a, in a room with an unmarried woman. So David HaMelech had a problem here. He couldn't marry her and he couldn't be in a room with her either whenever they were alone because she was not married. So here's that problem for you. David HaMelech was stuck and this was his only, it was, it was his only cure. And what happened at the end? At the end of the story, the Chachamim made a heter. The Chachamim actually took away this decree that you would not be able to be in a, 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 in a room alone with an unmarried woman in order for David HaMelech to be able to be with this, uh, with this girl, Avishag, to be with her. So that she would give him that warmth. Now, just to clarify, this was just to be his nurse. David Amelech did nothing else with this woman whatsoever. This was just a young woman. We're not like I said, we're, we cannot get into the details as to why this helped him, but it helped him. But it was nothing of the sort of what people these days would think that oh, he was doing things with her, or it was it, no, not at all. Wasn't like that at all. This was completely an emotional state. Period. Ah, Stephen. Valze Amar Rab Shemen. On this, Rab Shemen Bar Abba says in the Gemara, "Bor e kama kashim girushin." Come and see how difficult divorce is. And what, so it's such a thing that we should always try to avoid. Because the Chachamim took away their decree of Yichud, took away their decree that they had decreed for a man to be alone in a room would have been Asur. They took that decree away so that not to force David HaMelech to have to divorce one of his wives just to be able to marry this one. So this actually the Gemara is telling us the world that we see around us where marriage has completely become a joke literally a, a temporary testing the waters the Gemara is basically saying no my friends it ain't that easy it's not that easy to just get married and then oh you know what six months into it two years into it well <laughs> what can I say you know it just didn't work out it, it, it doesn't work that way and that is why it, it was brought just like Steve, um, Stephen just pointed out. It actually brings it down in the Gemara. The Gemara says quite clearly, come and see how difficult it is. A situation of divorce, a person should try their best to avoid because of this. It's not so easily done. Unfortunately, in today's day and age, divorce has become a, um, a scapegoat. You know, people literally get married knowing that there are problems in the relationship, but they say, you know what, worse comes the worse. You know, this is what we're going to do. That's not what marriage is for. It's, it's to be, marriage is something for a person to work at. For everybody. Now, therefore, listen to this, guys. This is, this is an important point that we're going to make. And when David Amelech was with this girl in his room all those years, what happened? David Amelech never, ever, ever even thought about, never even thought about actually being with her. What happened? He was metaken. He fixed the avon, the sin that he had with Bathsheba. What was the problem with Bathsheba? Bathsheba was the mother of Shlomo Amelech. Now, that's another controversial issue that happened in the times of David HaMelech. Bathsheba was at the time married to someone else. And then she was divorced temporarily to be remarried again to her husband. However, in the middle of all of that, David HaMelech saw 
in a prophecy that Bathsheba is truly his wife, meant to be his. And he saw in prophecy that the, that the child that will build the Beit HaMikdash is going to come from Bathsheba. So he knew this is it. You know, her husband has divorced her. Even though it's temporary, it's probably not temporary because I see in Nevoah that she is actually my rightful wife. So he went and took her. However, the Navi came to her afterwards and said, you made a mistake. You should not have done so so hastily. You should have waited for the right time to actually do it in a right way. Why did you do it in a hidden way? And that was counted, chas v'shalom, it was counted as some kind of an some kind of an avon, a sin for David HaMelech. Even though David HaMelech in Tehillim, as we said a few months back in one of our shiurim, as David HaMelech says in Tehillim, Khatati Hashem Elokai, I only sinned against you, God. I didn't sin against anybody else. I didn't sin against Bathsheba's husband. Nobody else. The mistake I made was towards you. And I'm ready to take the fall for it. However, when David HaMelech was in a room with this girl for so long, and he did nothing with her, and he had no um, uh, thoughts of even being with her, he was finally metaken, he fixed the avon of Bathsheba. That sin that he had with Bathsheba was erased. Because he knew that he can't marry her, he couldn't marry Avishag, and knowing that he can't marry her, what did he do? Imagine, a person has a dilemma. He's very ill. And the only thing that could help him is to marry this woman. But oops, he's married too many wives already. He's not allowed to have another wife. What does he do? As a king, he could have made decrees. He could have had excuses. None of the above. He didn't do any of those. He suffered through it, having a younger in his room. And not once did it ever entice him. And because he held himself back so strong, he was metaken. He fixed the original avon that he had with Bathsheba. And the Navi elaborates the things that happened in the house of David HaMelech at that time. Now we're going to get into what was going on in the house of David when David HaMelech was not feeling well. <coughs> and it was, I mean, to many, clearly almost the end of his life. One second, please. Sorry, I just want to ask people on Zoom, if you're going to come on Zoom, please have your correct names. Make sure your correct names come up on Zoom because I, I don't want to have random people coming on Zoom. Sometimes you don't even know who they are that are um, being admitted into the Zoom meeting. So if your name is a random name, please either show your face or introduce yourselves so we know who is in the shiur. Thank you. I see one that's MC App. I don't know who that is. Please introduce yourself. Okay, so now, the Navi says, while David HaMelech was not feeling well, while he was ill, Adonyahu, Adonyahu was, was David HaMelech's son, from, from his wife, Chagit. Chagit's son, David HaMelech's son. Hachal lehovil ma'alach shavu shavu yiyye ha'melech lacha patirato shel aviv. He started basically acting in a way and doing things as if he is going to be the king after David HaMelech. Now we know who became the king after David HaMelech. It was Shlomo HaMelech, not Adonyahu. However, when David HaMelech was not feeling well, he was ill in bed, Adonyahu, his son, started acting as if he's going to take the throne afterwards. And on top of that, he started, <clears throat> he started doing things that would show as if he's already almost there to become the next king. He started gathering people. He started um, um, gathering uh, 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 quite many people as if he's trying to gather an army. And this was all on top of the fact that Adon Yahu was the son of David HaMelech and he had the greatest upbringing. His father was David HaMelech. He, he had a good upbringing. Now listen to what Melachim says. In Melachim it says, 
the, the, the Navi actually attests to it. That in all of his days, Adon Yahu, in all of Adon Yahu's days, David Amelech never once worried to tell Adon Yahu, hey, why did you do this? That was not right what you did. Or why did you do that? He never did. And Adon Yahu was also very good. And he was born after Avshalom. The Navi is actually telling us, maybe, could the Navi be telling us that Adon Yahu was doing this because in all of his life, his father never chastised him. You know, in today's day and age, like today, what do we have today? We have a lot of parents that um, are open-minded, call themselves open-minded parents, open-minded parenting. You know, whenever you ask them, you know, have you asked your son why he did this? Or have you asked your daughter why she decided to do that? Why did she do this wrong thing? Why did he do that wrong thing? They always say, well, you know, we're very open-minded family. We're very open about our upbringing. So we just let our children experience what they experience. And later on, they will learn on their own. We really believe on letting our children be raised on their own, to grow up on their own, so that they can experience life on their own. Blah. <laughs> That's what I like to say. I call that, and many, 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 many teachers and psychologists call that lazy parenting. That's not being open-minded. It's just simply being lazy. Parents that don't want the headache of getting involved in quarreling with their children and telling them what's wrong from right, they're just lazy. They'd rather just sit back and see what happens. It's not parenting. So here... Can we say that this is what was happening? The Navi is actually saying, His father never even worried, he never chastised him to tell him, you're doing this, why did you do this, or why did you do that? So it could be because of this Avshalom, because, sorry, Adon Yahu grew up to kind of revolt against his father's kingship and try to take the kingship while his father was still alive. called all the servants of the king and he invited people to a place called Ein Rogel, to a, to, to a certain place. And over there he made a big seuda, he made a big, big, big feast, right? And Natan Hanavi and Shlomo Hamelech, which was David Hamelech's son, son of Bathsheba, were not invited to this feast. What does that tell you? You don't invite the Navi. You don't invite the only son that people think is going to be the next king. What is that? What are you doing then? It's a coup. Everyone's going to know, okay, you know, this, this kid is trying to become the next king. That's why he's not inviting the, the Navi. He's not inviting the Navi and he's not inviting Shlomo because he wants to go alone at this. So what happened next? Natan Navi comes to Bathsheba and Shlomo Amelech. And he says to them, um, Natan Navi comes to Bathsheba and Shlomo Amelech and says to them, listen, this is what's going on. Adonio has gathered his own men and he's had a feast and listen to what he says. Hold on. Oh, sorry, sorry. Let's go back. Right. Natan Anavi comes to Shlomo Melech and Bat Sheva which Bathsheba was, was Shlom, um, Shlomo Amelech's wife, um, Bathsheba was Shlomo Amelech's mother. So the Natan Aravi goes to David Amelech and Bathsheba, Shlomo Amelech's mother, and says, Adon Yahu has invited people to a feast, and he's gathered people, and it looks like he wants to take the kingship. However, Natan Aravi changes the language a little bit. What did he do? Because the Navi says, Adonia ben Chagit mitnase lemor ani emloch. Adonia was going around saying, I shall be king. I will be king. 
That's what Adonia was doing. Which means later on he's going to be, right? However, when Nathan Anavi was telling David Amelech and Shlomo Hamelech, he said what? Humosif. He added something. He added and he said, you know, King David, you know, Bathsheba, you know what people are saying to Adonyahu? They're saying, Yechi HaMelech Adonyahu. Long live the king Adonyahu. And that had never actually happened. That had never occurred. Adonyahu was gathering people. Adonyahu was making a feast as if he's going to be the next king. But he never asked people to call him king. And people never called him king. And people never went around saying, Long live Adonyahu. And therefore, what happened right away? David HaMelech gets up and he swears to Shlomo HaMelech and he puts him on his throne, making Shlomo HaMelech the king as of now. Shlomo HaMelech was 12 years old, 12 years old at the time. That day, Shlomo HaMelech became crowned and he sat on the throne. When people at the Seuda when people that were sitting at the Seudah of Adonyahu heard that David HaMelech crowned Shlomo and sat him on his throne, they literally all ran away. They did not want to deal with this mess. They all got up from the feast of Adonyahu and they ran away. All the people that were called to Adonyahu, they all went in their own ways. Now, the Zera Shimshon asks this question. Here's when we come to the questions of Zera Shimshon. Zera Shimshon asks a couple of questions. Number one, when we're dealing with the sons of the kings, Adonyahu, Shlomo HaMelech, all these people, we have to understand something very crucial. We're not dealing with normal people. Adonyahu was no, no normal person. He was no mediocre person. He was the, he was the son of David HaMelech. He was brilliant, he was anav, he was, he, was, he was a great person, right? So the, so the Zerah Shimshon asks, Didn't Adonyahu know the general rule that no one will ever become king while there is another king? Didn't you know this? It's a general rule. You cannot have two crowned princes under the same exact crown. You can't have two people that are going to lead the same country. No two kings are going to rule at the same time. So if Adonio was so intelligent, why was he trying to steal the kingship, so to speak, from his father while his father was still alive? He knew that's not going to happen. It's just unnatural. That's against all the rules. Number two, second question is, Didn't David Amelech teach his son? Didn't David HaMelech do a good job as a father for his son? That even the Navi writes this about him? The Navi says, ah, and his father never even told him, don't do this or don't do that or stop that or stop this. He never bothered. As if to tell us, that's why this happened to Adonyahu. The reason why Adonyahu reacted this way and he started gathering people to make him to crown himself as the king while his father was on his deathbed was because he didn't have a good upbringing. His father never gave him a patch on the hand. His father never told him not to. Could that be true? And third question is, why is it, this was a very interesting one for me, why is it that when Natan Anavi comes and retells the story of Adonyahu gathering people and, and, and mimicking as if, making believe as if he's going to be the next king, Adonyahu comes and adds upon that. And Adonyahu says to David Amelech and, and Bathsheba, you know what's happening? He's already crowding himself and people are already saying, Yechi Amelech Adonyahu. Something that had never, not happened. It was just not true. So why was Natan Alavi giving a false report of something that didn't even happen? How could he do that? He's a prophet. Now, so he starts to answer. Ela Mavar Azar Shimshon, the Mazar Shimshon says, Adonyahu, the son of Chagit, was such a child 
this son of Avraham was such an amazing boy <coughs> he was such an amazing boy that David HaMelech never actually needed to chastise him he never needed to tell him right from wrong he was a complete person he was a great person he was a Baal Chochma he had Chochma and he was very Anav he never needed to scream at him or tell him why are you doing this or why are you doing that Adonio never did anything that was against the will of his father David HaMelech and therefore as we see that the Rambam also Maimonides has a Psak Halacha he says the rule is if the, a king has two sons one of them, Echad Chacham, Vechad Yere Shamayim. He has one son. This son is a big time. He's a Chacham. He's very wise. He has one son that's very wise. And he's, he has another son that's not as wise, but he has Yerat Shamayim. He has a lot of fear of heaven. Which would you guys say you should give the kingship to? Who should be chosen as the leader of the, of the nation? The one that is a Baal Chokhmah, the one that is wise, or the one that is Yirei Shamayim, the one that has fear of heaven. Which should be given to? Which one of these deserve to be king? Fear of heaven. Wisdom. Okay, so we got 50-50, wisdom and fear of heaven. The Rambam Paskins, this is Halakha. The Rambam says, Yeshlatlet et ha-melucha leven ha-yirei shamayim. You should give the kingship to the son that has Yirat Shamayim. Because no matter how much Chokhmah you have, if you don't have fear of heaven, it's pointless. You're going to destroy everything. Because even your Chokhmah is going to lead you to places that you shouldn't be. Lead you to want things that you shouldn't want. And therefore when you have Yirat Shamayim, which Shlomo HaMelech had so much of, when you have Yirat Shamayim, everything else comes with it. Vaim can... Sorry, Josh, you have a question? Yeah, so I don't understand. So they're basically like downplaying the Tamir Chacham. I mean, so you're assuming he's a Tamir Chacham and he has your Shammai? Is that one and the same? Good, or, good, or, or the two okay, okay good, good question. Good question. Um, put it to you this way. There have been people in the past... Um, some of which actually, I don't remember the names, some of which that even re were, were responsible for the conservative movement were not regular people. One of which, I, 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 I'm trying to remember his name, I don't remember, but he was one that wrote many, many books of Chidushim. Many books of scholarly Chidushim, ideas that would boggle your mind in Torah and mitzvot, their own Chidushim but they wrote them on Shabbat while smoking a cigarette. Uh, a cigar, actually. He used to smoke cigars. Now, you ask yourself, when you read the Chidushim, you think to yourself, this is a person that had so much Chokhmah of Torah. So much! Yet, to describe the same exact Torah that tells you not to light a fire on Shabbat, not to write on Shabbat, you could sit and write your Chidushim on Shabbat? How do you do that? The answer is, like you were, tr you were asking, Yirat Shamayim and Chokhmah don't come together. You could be a Talmud Chacham, you could have a lot of wisdom of Torah, but it doesn't mean you have Yirat Shamayim. It doesn't mean you have fear of heaven. Right? If you don't have fear of heaven, you have nothing. That's what Shlomo HaMelech says. First, fear Hashem and then keep His mitzvot. you got to have fear of heaven. If you don't have fear of heaven, you could be packed up here, full of wisdom, but it's, yeah, it's information. It's like mathematics. It's like one time, Aristotle, I think it was Aristotle, if I'm not mistaken, he was sitting somewhere, or one of these wise men, he was sitting somewhere, and he was completely, completely drunk. And someone that met him 
saw him and he said, aren't you Aristotle? He says, yeah. He says, I don't understand. You're one of the most famous philosophers. People follow you. And you, yeah, I mean, you, you're, you're worshipped. How, 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 how could you be so drunk? You're on the floor full of mud in the streets. So he answers him. He says to him, let me ask you something. If I was a mathematician, if I was a geometry teacher, would I look like a triangle? Should I look like a square? No. So he says, look, I teach the things that I know. It doesn't mean I have to be it. Well, with Torah and mitzvot, with the Torah, it's the exact opposite. When you learn Torah, you also have to work on it to become a part of you, to kind of change you. And that's where the Yirat Shamaim comes in. If you're going to just learn Torah and just you know, grab all that information, grab all that chokhmah, and it goes up here, and it doesn't go down here, something is missing. You have to connect the heart to the mind. You have to have the chokhmah, and you have to have the Yirat Shamaim, which is in your heart. Yirat Shamaim has to go hand in hand with it. And therefore, okay, so, oh, sorry. So the, so, so the Rambam says, that when a king has one of the king's sons is a Yirat Shamaim and the other one is a Chacham, you should give the kingship to the one that has Yirat Shamaim. Because that's better than the Chacham. So, therefore, Adonyahu who did have Yirat Shamayim, we'll see, we'll see, at least at this point, he thought that the kingship should be given to him, because he had Yirat Shamayim. And really, to answer that question, he didn't want to take the kingship during his father's reign. He didn't want to take it. Because two kings cannot have the same crown. He was going to wait until King David, his father, would pass away, and then he would. So he was thinking to his own cheshbon, look, I know I have Yirat Shamaim, I know that I have it, therefore I'm probably going to be picked. Because I'm older, I'm going to be picked to be the next king. Therefore he was just starting to, you know, amass his... Uh, start uh, amassing his army and getting his followers and so on and so forth. Now go back to the question that we asked. Madua Hanavi, then why did Natan Hanavi change his words when it came to Adonia? We said that Adonia, what did Adonia do? He just invited people to a feast and they sat and they ate and he was basically opening the way for, his, uh, for the day of his crowning and becoming the king. But Natan, when, when, when Natan and Avi came to David HaMelech and Bathsheba, he said, and you know, people are sitting there and people have already started saying, Yechi HaMelech Adon Yahu, long live the king Adon Yahu, as if he's already crowning himself. Why did he change? Why did he change the wording? Why did he add things which were not true, seemingly? The Talmud Yerushalmi tells us, in the name of Rabbi Shemuel Bar Nachman, Beshem Rabbi Yochanan, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. You guys ready for this? Mutar lomar lashon hara al ba'alea machloket. It is permissible to say lashon hara on ba'alea machloket, on people that start strifes. If you know somebody that is trying, that is trying to start a strife, is trying to bring uh, disunity and breaking like a nation apart or a family apart. You know someone that's trying to do that? It is mutar to speak Lashon Hara about them in order to stop them. And Antan Anavi said, Adon Yahu is trying to start a machloket. He's going to break out into a civil war soon. He's already going and amassing the people over there. He's got a feast going on as if he's going to be the next king. And I know that David HaMelech has promised Shlomo HaMelech to be the next king. Next thing you know, there's going to be a civil war. I got to stop it right now. And the only way to do it was to blow it out of proportion. Make it even bigger. And it wouldn't be Lashon Hara. And the Yerushalmi says, 
שראה באדוניה כבעל מחלוקת ולכן ציפר עליו לשון הרע. He said לשון הרע because he saw him as a בעל מחלוקת. He was someone that was starting a strife. ואתם לקח מבואר and you, uh, the reason for it is in the Sefer Ba'al Etemer which says that Makhloket can come to later on to spilling blood and the Ba'al Makhloket, the person that is, this is something for us to really know. A person that is starting a strife, is, uh, he is equivalent to a Rodef. You guys know what a Rodef is? A rodef in halakha basically is someone that is chasing someone else with a knife or a gun to kill them. The person that's holding the knife or the gun is called a rodef. Now in halakha, the rodef must be stopped no matter what. You can actually kill him before he even hurts anybody. Because he has a deen of a rodef. Therefore here also, because Adonyahu had the deen of a rodef, he had been already marked as a rodef. Why? Because he was trying to start a strife and that could have led to a civil war which would have had a lot of blood spilled therefore Natan navi stopped it in its tracks said I'd rather say Lashon Hara which I'm mutar to do so I'm allowed to do so because I will be stopping someone from possibly causing bloodshed then when Adonyahu heard that David HaMelech had made Shlomo HaMelech the king and crowned him Every, everything changed. He realized, oops, I've made a huge mistake. And therefore, he ran away and he went all the way to the Mizbeach and he held on to the Mizbeach as if to beg for his life so that they don't come and take him. And over there, Shlomo HaMelech, which had already become king. Now remember, Shlomo HaMelech at this time is 12 years old. Okay? You can see what, what an unbelievable chokhmah Shlomo HaMelech already had. Shlomo HaMelech sends a letter to Adonyahu and he says to him, Im ben chayil, ben chayil, and literally means a warrior, but that's not what he meant. He says, if you're going to be a warrior, then you will not be hurt. Ve'im ra'a timtsebo, but you, if you are wicked, if I find you wicked, you will die. Which was basically, Shlomo HaMelech was telling him, a ben chayil, you know, when, when, when you want to tell someone in Hebrew, in, in, um, in like a Torah language, you want to tell somebody to go higher and higher, um, um, uh, to go higher and higher in Torah and mitzvot, to do better and better, you say you should go mechayil el chayil, to go from strength to strength, Right? It, it refers to Torah and it refers to Kedusha and, and holiness. Therefore, Shlomo HaMelech was asking Adon Yahu, are you for holiness? Are you for the laws of the Torah? Or are you ra'a? Are you being wicked and you're actually trying to take the kingship from me? If you're actually going towards Torah and you're a Ben Chayil, then I will not hurt you. But if you're trying to actually start a strife, then you're a Ben Mavet. That means you, you're, th- th- it has to be, you have the death penalty because you're revolting against the kingship. And therefore, at that moment, at that moment, Adonyahu said that he is not, he is not revolting against David HaMelech and Shlomo HaMelech, and Shlomo HaMelech left him alone. Now, Later on, just to finish up with this, later on, when time passes, going back to the story of Avishag, who was the, who was the nurse of David HaMelech, later on, when David HaMelech passes away, Adonyahu comes and asks Bat Sheva if he can go ahead and if she can go ahead and make the Shiduch for Adonyahu to marry Avishag. And Bathsheba, Shlomo Melech's mother, goes to Shlomo Melech to ask Shlomo Melech what he thinks of this. That Adonyahu wants to marry Avishag to ask permission for him to allow it to happen. Not seeing anything wrong with it. However, when, when, when Shlomo Melech hears this, he says, now I know that Adonyahu is actually trying to revolt and take the crown. 
And the Zerash Mishon asks, why? Why did this mean that Adonyahu wants to take the crown? He just wanted to marry a girl that was never married before. And uh, his father had already, David HaMelech had already passed away. Avishag was just a nurse of David HaMelech. However, Shlomo HaMelech explained to his mother that you see the halakha is, and it's an interesting halakha. Any, any nurse of a king, any misharetav, misharetav mean any helpers of the king that are women, nurses of the king, or any wives of a king that become almanot, that are widowed, regular people are not allowed to marry them. They're only allowed to be married by other kings because it's disrespectful to the kings, the previous kings, for their wives to marry regular, regular laymen. Therefore, only kings are allowed to marry them. And Avishag, even though she wasn't really married to David Amelech, even though she was never married to him, she was, she was a part of his family at that point. She had nursed him to back to health at a, at a certain point. And because of that, she had become a part of the faculty of David Amelech. And therefore, Shlomo Amelech said, this is a sign Adon Yahu is again coming for the crown. And he actually was coming for the crown. And unfortunately, that's why Shlomo Amelech sent for Adon Yahu to be called Moreb Malchut, revolting against the kingship, and he, was, and he was punished for it. Now, the reason I believe that this was actually the Haftarah that was used for Chayesara to go back to the beginning, and the reason why I wanted to speak about this tonight and give this shiur is because the Pasuk says, Avraham zaken babayamim. And Avraham had become old in age with days. Babayamim, with the coming of days. And the Chachamim ask a question. What does it mean with the coming of days? When you want to say somebody got old, you just say, Avraham zaken. And Avraham became old. Right? Why does it say babayamim? And the Chachamim answer, one of the answers the rabbis give is that Babayamim means that not only Abraham Avinu was old in age, in years, but he was old in days. Meaning every single day of Abraham Avinu's life was used perfectly. Not a moment of his life was wasted. Every day was accounted for. So those 180 years of, that Abraham Avinu lived was lived in perfection. They were complete. He was a complete being. He had completed his task in this world, which Bezrat Hashem, we should be always all zochet to be able to say this, that we come to this world and we complete our tasks in this world. Unfortunately, not many of us, we're all Gilgulim, we're all reincarnated for the same reason. We haven't completed our tasks. But Avraham Avinu was Zaken Baba Yamim, meaning he completed his task perfectly. He had no imperfections. And therefore the Navi also comes to connect that to David HaMelech. And David HaMelech it says, Vahamelech David Zaken Baba Yamim. And David also became Zaken Baba Yamim. He completed his life perfectly. Because there were so many controversial stories about David HaMelech, one of which is mentioned in this Navi. The Gemara says, those who say David was a sinner, chas shalom, are mistaken. David never sinned. David was not a sinner. And to prove it, the Navi says, David zaken babayamim. Just like Avraham Avinu lived his life perfectly in tzitkut, in holiness and righteousness, so too David HaMelech also, just like his forefather David ha- Avraham Avinu lived his life in perfection, in tzitkut, in righteousness and holiness. Yes, we all make mistakes. But are we able to get up after those mistakes and fix them? Are we able to metaken those mistakes? As we said, David Melech was metaken. He fixed the mistake that he made with Bathsheba through the story that he had with Abishag. Because if anybody would have seen David Amalek at that point, they would be like, listen, you're old, you're cold. There are so many loopholes you can use to just marry Abishag or do something. Or as Stephen said, just divorce one of your wives and just marry this one. She's young, she's wonderful. David Amalek said, no. It doesn't feel right, it's not right. He did not give in to his Yetzer Hara. And because he did not give in to his inclination and his desires, 
he was able to break free of that avera that he had, so to speak, avera quotations that he had with Bathsheba years before. Baruch Adonai le'olam. Amen ve'amen.